Palm Sunday. My name is Matt Russell, and um, I'm the pastor of missions and outreach. We're so glad that you're joining us this morning, whether you're here in the sanctuary or downstairs in our second worship space or joining us online. We want to welcome you. A few announcements for us. Um, first of all, there's an eight-week study called Kingdomizer that's beginning on Wednesday, March 27th. Um, it starts uh, at 6.30 p.m. in the home of Marty and Karee Greer. This is an eight-week study on developing a biblical worldview, and it's limited to 12 people, so we want to encourage you to sign up soon. Uh, next, our Good Friday service will be this Friday, March 29th. It'll start at 7 p.m., and it'll be here in the sanctuary in Hill House, will be leading us um, that night. So I want to invite all of you to come. It's going to be a great time of celebration, of worshiping together, hearing about how God has been at work through our Bless Every Home initiative this past month. And then Resurrection Sunday is next Sunday, and we'll have three services, 8.30, 10, and 11.30. And if possible, we'd like to encourage you to both bring us to bring as few cars to campus as possible, so carpool if able. And then also, if it's the same to you, we'd encourage you to either choose the 8.30 a.m. service or the 11 a.m. service, 11.30 a.m. service, because that 10 a.m. service will likely be our very popular one and packed. Um, Want to let you know we're super excited about two mission trips that are coming up uh, this fall. We'll be um, going to Costa Rica in September, and then India in October. And if you're interested in being a part of either one of those trips, I want to encourage you to scan that QR code up there or see me after the service. I can let you, have, uh, let you know more information about those trips um, that, are, that are coming. <clears throat> and then we also want to let you know that if you have any prayer requests or questions, if you just want to get in touch with our church staff, there's a QR code in front of you. You can scan that. Let us know your questions, and we will get back with you um, as soon as we can. Will you stand and uh, join me as we read the scripture together? <clears throat> From Psalm 107, 8 and 9, read with me. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things.
marvelous name of the good names of God. Marvelous name of the good names of God.
Wow. Oh, I want you to know Christ. I want you to know Jesus personally, intimately, ultimately. There is nothing or no one you could ever encounter or know or walk with. There's no experience you could ever engage with or become familiar with it that's anything like or anything compared to Jesus. He's our creator. He's our savior. He's the friend that sticks closer than anyone else could. He's our guide. He's our sustainer. He's our provider. He's our protector. He's all those things we've just sung about and so, so much more. He is the king of the universe, the king that reigns eternally. He's the Lord, the boss, the overseer of it all, and he's good. He's better than the best good you can imagine, and he has his heart of mercy and grace and love aimed at your soul. He loves you. He, his intentions for you are good. Nothing but good, all good, better than the best good you can ever imagine. I want you to know him. There's nothing like Christ. It's so what we sing. I, I sing my song. I give my all. Oh, I, I want that for each of us to go after him, to love him, to get to know him, to con- continue to pursue getting to know him, to, to continue to pursue trusting him, to continue to pursue obeying him. This is where life is known and found, and there's no other life available that comes close. I want you to know Jesus as I'm getting to know him even more and more day in and day out. Let's pray. God, thank you for this time where we can declare what's true in such powerful songs and we can lift our voices together. It's awesome. And so God, we receive this hour, this time as a gift from you. And Lord, we just now pause and say, not only to say thank you, but also, God, please enter into our study time. We want you to be the teacher. God, I thank you for the privilege you've given me to stand and teach, but God, please let it be that it's really you, that you through your word, through the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would give each of us ears eager to listen carefully, but also uh, willing to listen thoughtfully where we would be receptive to even hard things, you might say. God, if you're going to call out some things that that need changing, that we need to repent of and confess and say we're sorry and go a different direction, God, give us those kind of ears this morning. And I thank you, God, that you're doing that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be seated, please. Find a copy of the Bible, if you would. Find the book of Psalms. Psalm 107 is where we're going to be today. There's 150 total of these. I'm not going to hit them all as we have not hit them all, but we are, let's see, I'm going to do this. We are working our way through many of them. We should finish, we will, Lord willing, finish the book of Psalms by the end of the summer. Of course, next Sunday, as Matt alluded to in the announcements or pointed out in the announcements, next Sunday's Easter. How awesome is that? So today's Palm Sunday. Um, a couple of big things. Let me just reiterate, and some may be coming in after Matt uh, shared the announcements here. We've got these little invitation cards available. I'd love to have you take a stack of them and give them to people. This is, it's the, maybe the best Sunday of the year to invite folks who haven't yet become believers in Christ. Maybe they're looking for a church home. Maybe they don't know what they're looking for, but they're looking for something. And we have the opportunity to present the real source of hope to them next Sunday. So uh, invite them, use these, please take those, invite them. And along those lines, though, there is a little bit of kind of schedule crowd management that helps the process. We want, if we got a space problem, that's a good problem. We we embrace that all day. But with a little bit of uh, maybe kind of cooperation with each other, we can make it work as well as we can. So what we want to do, three services, not our typical two, 8, 30, 10, and 11, 30. It's just, you know, the natural flow of things is the middle service out of those three would work, is the most popular. So if it's in essence six of one, half a dozen another to you to go come at 8, 30 or 11, 30, if you could kind of target those, if not, it's okay. It's okay. We're going to make it work. 
We've got the basement open. And if you were here Christmas Eve, which was a Sunday this past year, we did the same schedule. We had like the downstairs basement. By the way, I was down there for part of worship. Hey, guys, down there. And, uh, and thanks for those of you that have tried it or sometimes do go down there. It's a, not a bad uh, venue for, for the service. It's pretty good. But it should accommodate about 60 or 70. At the middle hour on Christmas Eve, we had 100 people down there. Yeah, that was kind of crazy. So we've got stuff available. We'll have the fellowship hall available for overflow, uh, Lord willing, if we need that. So we've got space. We'll make space work. But if it's six of one, half a dozen of the other to you, you know, if you could uh, come to 8.30 or uh, 11.30, that, that kind of helps maybe a lot of our neighbors who uh, would be coming and might just say, ah, the middle one looks good, or, or for whatever reason is most convenient to them. So, all right, that's the first thing. Um, also, I mean, God's just up to some amazing things. We had an amazing women's event Friday night. I'm so thankful for it. Um, great time yesterday morning with Mark Richt, and I understand that the Vintage had a great hymn sing last night. It's just great things through the month of March, culminating, obviously, next weekend with our Good Friday service and then Easter Sunday. So I hope that you'll be a part of that. We've tried to partner together, kind of a team effort uh, around praying for our community through the month of March. And so uh, those that have engaged in the Bless Every Home, um, you know, focus and, and gotten the app, here's the, kind of the latest update. By God's grace, we've recorded at least at Mars Hill Community Church, not just prayers in general for our neighborhood and our neighbors, but specific prayers by name. Uh, for our neighbors, over 15,500 prayers over this month of March, which have been incredible. Uh, opportunities to connect to the, to the tune of 174 of those that we've recorded. And then uh, opportunities to have a spiritual conversation or a gospel conversation, uh, 70 this month, which is incredible. And, and I believe this last week of the month, it will be the best. And so let's get, we've we got one, month, one week left here. Let's, let's jump in on it. Uh, these are the, where people have recorded, participated as what we call quote-unquote lights through this program all around, 240, I think, of us. And some of the red dots are the, the specific homes we've recorded praying for people that live there by name around us, which is, which is great. And then we've also challenged uh, as many as are willing to fast and pray this month, and here's how many have done so in a way where they've recorded it for us uh, so we can kind of celebrate that and be thankful. Um, so and I've, I've asked everybody who's willing to take this Friday, Good Friday, coming up as a day to fast and pray. That we might take those three meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, instead of eating or prepping food, just to focus on praying. Seeking the Lord together and uh, asking the Lord to move in us and through us for our community. So that's a, looking ahead to that. Very, very excited about it. God's been doing things, is doing things. And uh, I'm just very, very humbled and thankful to be a part of it. Um, so, all right, you guys ready to dig into Psalm 107? Uh, following whatever translation you have. And by the way, up on the screen here, you see the phone number. We do, I think we'll have some time today. We, I was able to tackle one question in the first service. So you see that number up there. You can use that to text questions in during the message. And uh, sometimes that's scary and, and it stinks, but sometimes it's helpful. So we like to try it because it's helpful. Um, and it's, I'm just joking about the scary and stinks part. It's, it's, uh, it can be challenging, but the, most of the questions are great. So send in a question. If you've got one, perhaps somebody else has a similar one, and it will really enhance our time of learning together. So all right, here's what we're going to do. You ready? Psalm 107. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I want to pull from it key passages. And we're going to build our focus of our study this morning around this idea we're going to look at the often overlooked, overwhelming power of basic obedience embedded in this psalm. We don't know who wrote this psalm. We don't know the exact uh, circumstances or time, uh, occasion of the writing, um, but it's, um, it, it's amazing. So here we go. I'm going to pull just a few verses. Verse 1 and the beginning of verse 2. I'm reading New American Standard. You can follow in whatever translation you've got. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord... For he is good. For his loving kindness is everlasting. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And then what we have in the rest of this psalm is four times that a scenario is presented where people get to the end of their rope and they cry out for God's help. And what happens when anybody cries out for God? Oh, he answers, he hears, and he listens, and he delivers. And we're going to see that celebrated in this psalm. 
So what I want to do is just pull those out and read them for you, and then we'll go back and fill in a little bit. But look in verse 6. Here's the first one. It's telling about people, the verses 2 through 5 were the scenario. Verse 6, it says, And then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them out of their distresses. And then what's their logical response to his miraculous and loving and powerful deliverance? Well, the response is to thank him and to praise him. So we see that in verse 8. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. All right, that's the first instance. Then we have another scenario. And then we get to verse 13. And it says, Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And he saved them out of their distresses. And what's their logical response to his miraculous delivery when they cried out to him? Verse 15, let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. And now a third time in verse 19, another scenario, and I, I kind of am going to put scenario two and scenario three together as one when we dig in here in just a minute. But here in verse 19, it says, Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. And what's their logical response to his miraculous deliverance? Verses 21 and 22. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. Let them also offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his works with joyful singing. And then one last time, fourth scenario, culminating in verse 28, where it says, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distresses. And of course, the proper response recorded in verses 31 and 32, let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. Let them extol him also in the congregation of the people and praise him at the seat of the elders." And then verses 33 through the end of the psalm is really a, a singing about declaring some truths about who God is that factor into the rest of what's celebrated here. So here's what I want to do with this this morning, brothers and sisters. Um, when we were back in Psalm 42, it, there was a, a couple of times it said this, what, what's recorded in the last verse of Psalm 42, which says, "'Why, my soul, are you downcast?' Why are you so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. We saw that in Psalm 43, I'm 42. It's also in Psalm 43. And it's this great foundation that the Psalms have included for us to say, you know, there's times I've got some inner darkness. I've got some inner stress, anxiety, perhaps depression, discouragement. It's, things are down. Or things even for people who believe in God, people who ultimately have put their faith and trust in God, still for followers of God, children of God, there's still times where my soul's just messed up within me. And we noted then, and I want to recall it this morning, it, it's right for us when things are dark within to take a look at it, to take a, a look at it prayerfully and to analyze it with the help of the Holy Spirit. And say, so why am I so downcast? What's going on in here where, where things just aren't working well or things are out of sorts? Even though I know that there's, you know, it's ultimately going to be fine. There's a day coming where I will praise God. He is, he is my hope. I'm asking him to kind of help me sort this out in the here and now. And, and I see that as very necessary and relevant for, our, for us digging into what I believe God wants us to learn this morning. Because we find ourselves quite often pressured and pained. And I believe in Psalm 107, we're given, I see it as three categories, three ultimate sources of what causes that internal turmoil that we need to take a look at. Um, and did you notice in verses, in all four of those instances, starting in verse six, they're worded exactly the same way. Did you notice that? Look in verse 6. It says, Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. All four times they cried out to the Lord, same exact words. And the description of what they were experiencing, uh, he, they cried out to them in their trouble. That tr the word trouble literally means, the Hebrew word for it is, they're in a narrow, squeezed condition. 
They're feeling the pressure. They're being squeezed. Whatever's going on that's making them cry is because they're feeling it. They're pinched. They're confined. They're being squished down, crushed in a sense. And then the other word that's used all four times, they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them out of their distresses. Some of the words in some of your translations may say out of their anguish. It literally just means pain. So this is what I want to look at because even for believers, there's a lot of our journey and there's a lot of sources of pressure and pain that cause us to experience pressure and pain. I want us to look at them and look at one in particular with a real focus. And so let me categorize these. Here's how I see the categories falling out in Psalm 107. The ones in verses 1 through 9, he's describing what I believe are people who are feeling the pressure, feeling the pain just because they live in in a part of a culture that's under the judgment of God or under the, I don't know how this is the right way to say it, but under the disfavor of God, whatever the opposite of favor is. And so when we see verses 2 through, two through 6, it's describing people wandering. It's describing people with no, don't know where they're going. They're in a wasteland. They're not in a habited place. They're not in a, they've got no direction. They've got no purpose. They've got no destination in mind. And really this described a couple of the seasons in the great history of, of the Israelite people. It described the season in the wilderness in Egypt when they came out of Egypt before they went into the promised land. And what you had was this whole culture basically under judgment by God because of their lack of faith. Well, if you were an individual there, you would have carried some of the weight, some of the pressure, some of the pain of being a part of a a punished culture. And remember, they didn't trust God. He said, I'm giving you the land. They said, we doubt you are. And so we're not going in. He said, okay, well, then all of you are going to just wander the wilderness for 40 years. Another time in Israel's history is obviously after the decades and centuries of disobedience and idolatry, which he warned them against, which they refused to repent for, and the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, comes in, takes them, carries them away, and they're gone. So you get verses 2 through 6 here, describing people, maybe no fault of their own individually, but you know what? They live in a time and a place that just, there, there's no inhabited city, there's no blessing, there's no favor. They're just wandering, purposeless. Well, that, that could be the case. I wonder sometimes if, if things don't turn sometime in the short term here for us as a culture, for us as a country, this could increasingly define the experiences of those who grow up in this country. But it was the case, and it got so bad that it says they, it, it caused them to be hungry and thirsty. They, they didn't have enough food. They didn't have a, a city where they could go to be protected and secured and take care of. So this was the first one of these categories of people who found themselves at, at the end of their ropes crying out for God's deliverance. And I want to skip to the third one, and then because we're going to come back and focus on the middle one. I think the second, I mean, the third category that's presented that we'll take as our second one we'll we'll touch on is people that are just swept up in the tragedies of this broken and fallen world. Look in verses 23 through 32. It's describing, verse 23, those who go down to the sea in ships who do business on the great waters. These are seafaring people, people that trade across the oceans, and then the big storm comes up, and they're about to die. And so, you know, this is not uncommon for you and for me. Where do you find yourself in the pressure and the pain? Sometimes Jesus said in the New Testament, look, in this world you'll have trouble. We understand in the New Testament that the whole creation bears the thumbprint of darkness and death. The whole creation is under the pains of decay. As a result, I mean, there's horrible things that happen. And followers of God, believers in Jesus are not immune. Did you know that? Yeah, Christians get cancer. Christians have heart attacks. Christians are victims of random acts of crime and violence. It's, it happens. It happens. And so maybe this, these guys, maybe that's the scenario presented here in this context. It's, they're out there on the sea and it's just, oh boy, we're about to drown. So that could be the case. But the third is where I want to give our focus. It's in verses 10 through 22, and I'm putting two of the groupings together, and I'll tell you why in just a second. We can find ourselves pressured and pained because of our own rebellion against God. Specifically, because of our own refusal to fully embrace and obey. 
the teachings of God. And this can be true for Christians. It's, you know, Jesus said he came to give us life and to give us life to the full. And, and I, I see those as two, I mean, obviously they're connected, but they're two di- distinct experiences or realities. And when someone comes to put their faith in Jesus and they recognize what we celebrate next week, he did rise from the dead. He did live a perfect sinless life. He did die a sacrificial death to cover my sins. He conquered the grave to give me eternal life. So I believe all that and I say yes to him and I receive that. So he is my Savior and Lord. My eternal destiny is secure. My identity is set. I'm a child of God. My name's been written in the Lamb's book of life in heaven. I'm a citizen of heaven. All that's settled, right? And even the sins that I will still continue to commit that displease God and that are contrary to his nature and his teachings, you know, I am forgiven of those. That's why Paul says in Romans, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's absolutely right. I'll never pay for my sin, quote unquote. I'll never be judged. Jesus paid it all. Jesus took my judgment. So that's the reality. Jesus said, I came to give you life, but also to give it to you to the full. So it's not just for what's coming in eternity when this life is over. It's also he came to totally transform how I experience and live here and now, right? And he described his heart and his leadership in our lives, if we follow, is that it's going to give us a life that's to the full. But I think what we see reflected here, people crying out to the Lord in their pain and their anguish, the pressure, is what God wants to teach us today and perhaps convict us of and draw our attention to. Because we are certainly susceptible to say, Jesus, thank you for saving me, giving me life, but how about I'll just take life to the half? Jesus said, I've come to give it to the full. We go, nah, I'll just take life to the half. I'll just take life to the tenth. Or I'll just take the life you want me to experience to the, how about a quarter? of it. I think this is what is the application for us today out of what's being addressed here, specifically in verse 11. But I want to give it a little caveat because this is a little bit of tender ground as we're pulling this critical teaching from the Old Testament into our New Testament context where we enjoy the finished work of Christ. First, please, please hear this clearly. We must never treat God like a genie in a bottle, right? Like, oh, if I just obey better, if I obey this percent, I get these these results. If I just kind of figure out how to work God like a genie in a bottle, if I rub rub it a little bit this way and I I pray these, say these words, the incantation or the certain prayers or do these, no, no, no. We've got to be careful never to do that. And we must never reduce our relationship with God to something formulaic. Like if you plug in inputs A and B, you're going to always get output C because it's not that. God is not a formula. God is not a genie. He's God. And he hasn't invited us into a formulaic religion. He's invited us into a relationship. So can we keep that in mind? As we dig in to what I think is critical for us to learn this morning, which is about a principle or principles, and we must give heed. Oh, I think that's supposed to be heed. I misspelled heed. We must also give heed to key principles as we pursue a growing relationship with him. And that's what I think is God serving up for us this morning. Now the temptation, let's call it what it is because we are who we are and we function how we function. The temptation is going to always be to take principles and try to make them formulas. So be on guard as we dig in, okay? But here are the principles for us this morning. First, God is sovereignly in control of every detail of our lives and the world around us. That's what is overwhelmingly talked about after the four scenarios in the end of the psalm. I mean, look with me there. Pick it up in verse uh, 33. Look, it says, He changes rivers into a wilderness and springs of water into a thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salt waste because of the wickedness of those who dwell in it. He changes a wilderness into a pool of water and a dry land into springs of water. And there he makes the hungry to dwell so that they may establish an inhabited city. And they sow fields and plant vineyards and gather a fruitful harvest. Also he blesses them and they multiply greatly. And he does not let their cattle decrease. When they are diminished and bowed down through oppression, misery, and sorrow, he pours contempt upon the princes and makes them wander in a pathless waste. But he sets the needy securely on high away from affliction and makes his families like a flock 
The upright see it and are glad, but all the unrighteous shuts their mouths. And so you see this thing that's celebrated in this song where it says God literally is that powerful and that active, transforms landscapes for or against the people who live there. He defends those needing defending, and he judges and casts out those who do the oppressing. He, he literally is that active and that powerful and that involved. And isn't that amazing? I mean, he takes, literally takes like wastelands that produce no crops and b- makes them burst with vegetation and fruit. There's places around the world where we've seen that happen, and we know that has happened and is happening. And other places to the converse. Or they, they were fertile lands that now are wastelands. I've seen a couple of those myself. We were in northern Iraq at one point, driving by what was the most in, uh, civilized, powerful, prosperous city on planet Earth in its day, which was Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire, to which the tribute of the nations flowed. You know what's there now? Nothing. Sand. Barren desolate waste. Yep. Even you see, not to get off track into some end times biblical prophecy, but the nation of Israel, all of a sudden, you know, it's a big hotbed of everything, right? But it, what, what was it? Where was it from basically 70 AD or 100 and something AD up until 1948? <laughs> Just about nobody lived there, a few people, but not much. Why? It was a desolate waste. Who wants to live there in a bunch of rock and dirt? You get to go over there now, you go, wow, kabam, this place is bursting with vegetation and fruit and produce and life. It's like, what's going on here? Yeah, yeah, that's that. this is this God. This is, this is our first principle. God is in control. E- even so much, so look at verse, verse 29. It talks about the, the sailors on the ocean, it, it, they're it brought to their distress. In verse 29, it says, He caused the storm to be still so that the waves of the sea were hushed. That's how sovereign, engaged, and active He is. Principle number one. So I'm not putting them in a formula, but we need to understand these rock-solid principles. And to those, he calls them in verse 42, as we read, the upright. And to those who call out to him, as we've seen four times throughout this song, anyone who will call out to him. By the way, isn't that a cool criteria? What's the criteria for people to be engaged with in a loving way by God? What's the criteria for people to get God's ear and to get God's power leverage for them? What's the criteria? How do you, how do you qualify You know how you qualify? You cry out, even in your despair. Anyone willing to cry out? We see this consistent through Scripture. In fact, Jesus in the New Testament, who is it? Who qualifies? Is whosoever will may come. And his call is, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, pressed and pained, and I'll give you rest. Isn't that awesome? So the upright or those who cry out to him, here's the principle. They're, they will, you will experience fundamentally, a fundamentally different life than those who don't. Your life will be saturated with the favor, blessing, and presence of God. Again, not to make it a formula. This doesn't mean that a Christian ever gets cancer, blah, 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 those things, right? But as a principle, this is absolutely true. This is what is being expressed in Psalm 107. And we need to understand that. And we pursue Him because of that. So here's the reality. There are Christians living in trouble and distress instead of freedom, joy, and power because, and again, please hear my warning, not because they've got some formula wrong, but because in some way they've egregiously ignored or otherwise violated a key principle, which is central to building a growing and thriving relationship with God. Here it is where our focus needs to be this morning. We are in this distress, perhaps, because we are rebelling against the words of God and spurning His counsel. Look with me at verse 11. This is, he says, because, they're in these dire straits. Why? Because they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel 
of the Most High. So you have this category, the first part of Psalm 107. People, maybe they, they've, they've, they're just a part of a culture that's un, some, uh, under some judgment of God. Or that third scenario where they're the, sea, the, the sailors on the ocean and it's just, you know, it's just part of the, the harsh world has, has risen up against them in this case. But this category, these people are at their wits end by their own doing by their own rebellious hearts, by somehow they're living, even those that are called children of God, they're even they're part of God's community, even they're part of God's people, but they say, you know what, Jesus, I'll, I'll take the 50%, life to the 50%, or life to the 10%. The, the part of God's words, and I think it's significant how it says in verse 11, because they rebelled against God's words or the words of God. So it's not just saying the word of God in its g- general overall sense as in the full counsel of Scripture, but it's, maybe it's specific instructions within the overall counsel. And then it finishes verse 11, and they, they spurn the counsel of the Most High. So this includes not just commands that they are neglecting to, to obey, but counsel, the wisdom that's given that they just are operating distinct and different from. And the reason I lump this together with the other one is look in verse 17, because this next category of people, I think I'm going to treat them, I see them as the same. It says the same thing, verse 17, that they are fools because of their rebellious ways. I think these things go together. And then when we get down to verse 20, the solution that he gives for them is actually his word. His word correctly understood and correctly followed. In fact, when we get to the New Testament, in case we're tempted to say, well, you know, hey, this is Old Testament. This doesn't apply to Christians in the New Testament. Oh, yes, it does. Jesus said this, whoever has my commands and keeps them, this is the one who's going to walk aligned with my direction. This is the one who's going to know life to the full. This is the one who loves me. You know, we can sing we love him, but he didn't say the one who sings loud in church is the one who loves me. The one who keeps, has my commands and keeps them, the one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to him. There's a, there's a revelation of himself to us available. Yeah, we're going to be in heaven, and yes, there's no condemnation when we trust Christ, but there's a lot of Christians experiencing a lot of things, perhaps. Go, why is this so messed up, oh my soul? Why is this part of my life never, not seem to be aligning the way I think a Christian life ought to look? Well, let's let... There, this could be the reason for you. And here it is. We, we, we can become very blind to the subtle yet serious ways that we become bitter or unpleasant toward God's words and or that we despise His counsel. And I've, I've put these words because th- these are the roots of the words, the Hebrew words used in verse 11. It says, my New American Standard says, when they had rebelled against the words of God, the root of that word is to become bitter or unpleasant toward Here's the reality, brothers and sisters. There could be key things necessary to how we are to live our lives, basic elementary obedience, to align with God's good plans for us. That for whatever reason, that little segment of Scripture perhaps, that little teaching, that little wisdom counsel, we, it's, we just have developed a bitter attitude toward it. We're like, I, I don't like that. That's challenging to me, therefore I'm not going to embrace it. I'm going to, it, it gives, it leaves a, that, that part, when I read that part of Scripture, it, it puts a bad taste in my mouth, so I'm going to treat it like I treat something bitter. Could be. We can become cl- blind to and the subtle ways that we can treat Scripture, pieces of Scripture that way. And then that last word there in verse 11 where it says they spurned the counsel, it means they despised his counsel. We took his wisdom and we said, no thanks. We took his wisdom and we said, oh, but, but modern psychology knows better. We took his wisdom and say, now nah, I know better. We despised it. And e- listen, even Christians who study the Bible a lot, who know the Bible a lot, who would consider themselves people of the Bible and generally have a lot of Bible knowledge, go to Bible studies and all those things, can be guilty of this, and it could be. I'm not saying blanket across the board. It could be the answer to that question, why so downcast within me, oh, my soul. It could be one of these. So I hope you'll, with a, if you're open to it, power of the Holy Spirit, you might take a look at these things in your life today. Because I believe what happens, even for Christians, it can put us in the condition described in verse 10. See how it says, those who dwelt in darkness and the shadow of death, they're prisoners in misery and chains. Even for Christians, we can walk around not living life or enjoying life to the full. And this could be the reason 
verse 11 describes. And, and our hearts are humbled the way it describes in verse 12. It says, therefore, he humbled their heart with labor. They stumbled with no one to help. Here's what I want to suggest. I, brother, we need to be on guard against and let the Holy Spirit ask us these questions. We need to be on guard against picking which parts of Scripture we want to obey. This is something even Christians can be susceptible to. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a man of the Bible. I'm a man of the Word. I'm a woman of the Bible. I'm a woman of the Word. Oh, except for that part that I don't like. Except for obeying that part that contradicts how I was raised, contradicts the philosophy I've embraced. Okay? Got to be on guard against that. We must be on guard against justifying away simple teachings and commands of Scripture that we don't like or agree with. Hey, we're really good at that. We've all done that. We've all been a part of that. We've all heard it where it's like, oh, well, maybe that doesn't mean what it really means. Let's look for some more complex definition of what it's actually saying. Or maybe that applied differently, you know, in some other cultural context than now. We can justify stuff away very easily that we don't like. Or we can just be negligent to seek out Scripture for the essential components of life. Like we didn't even think that how I'm supposed, God might ha- say something about how I carry myself as a student in high school. No, it's in there, but we just haven't looked for it to try to obey it. Or, or as an athlete on a team, oh, the Bible speaks to that. No, we, we just have been negligent not to even look for it. Or parenting, oh, parenting, yeah, uh, there's a Bible says a ton about that. Every aspect of, of our lives, if we go after it, there's his commands and his counsel available. So let me just give a couple for examples. <clears throat> And if you guys are open to this, I, mean, I want to do this with a little bit of sensitivity and kindness and trepidation. I'm a little, but uh, in the old school, old fashioned ways, they used to talk about preachers, quote unquote, stepping on your toes. You might know that familiar, that phrase, like, well, a preacher was stepping on our toes today. I don't want to step on your toes, but if God wants to, I want to just let him do it, okay? So we're about to enter that time. Are we convicted? Are we willing to be convicted? And I want to use an example here. So when the Israelites were under God's judgment for idolatry and disobedience, and God called them to repentance through the prophet Malachi, they had gotten so blind that they had, they had, the, they had the audacity to ask, how shall we return? So he, Malachi says, you guys got to repent. They were so blind, and this can happen to God's people. These are God's people. They were so but they go, what do you mean repent? They, they said in, in Malachi 3, 7, um, they, they said, how shall we return? And that's what they said, what do we have to repent of? And this is very instructive. God answers them by saying, look, get back to simple, basic obedience. There's something you're blind to. And so he said to them, uh, that he refocused them on the very practical commands of his word, which they were violating in the most elementary way. He said, he said to them, you're robbing God. And they said, what are you talking about? How are we robbing you? And he made it super practical, super simple. He said, I've told you to bring me tithes. And they said, we're bringing sacrifices. See, that's why it kind of parallels us as Christians. Why well, go to church? I'm in Bible study. I'm doing 90% of it. Uh, okay. But there's a super elementary, super clear, very fundamental, basic thing. And so he told them, yeah, but go back and read because what the word says is bring the best, bring the first. This is what the offerings look like. They're, We're bringing an offering. Oh, God confronted them. Oh, but you're bringing me your leftovers. You're bringing me the blind and the lame ones for sacrifice. My words, and they, maybe they had gone through these discussions. Maybe they had had ways they kind of justified it, like, well, you know what, that, those were different times back then than they are now. God's calling was just go back to what it says, plain, clear, easy to understand. Here's what's beautiful, as much as it is difficult about this. The things that we need to align with are things that if we took certain basic passages down to the third grade, this morning, they would be able to tell us exactly what it means very easily. It's that plain, it's that clear, it's that simple. This is why we can be blind to it, and we've got to be aware that we can be blind to it and not fall into that, because we could just go, uh, we say, well, maybe that means something more complex. Why? Because we don't want it to mean what it plainly means sometimes, right? So this is what happened to the Israelites, and this is what we need to see this morning. And so what he says in verse 20 here of Psalm 107, where, where 
He said, he sent his word and healed them. This is how he practically delivered them when they cried out to him. Those that had been bitter toward his words and, and you know, rebelled against his counsel. It says in verse 20, look, he says, he sent his word and healed them. This is how the deliverance came. But his word, like medicine, if you went to the doctor and said, hey, I have an illness, the doctor goes, oh, here, this will heal you. It's one thing to have the doctor give it to you. It's one thing to hold it in your hand, but you got to take it, right? That's the point for us this morning. And I believe, look in verse 14, that's why I kind of put these two together, these two scenarios, because when it says he brought them out of darkness, I think metaphorically, this is, he's bringing them the word, he's bringing them the light, he's bringing, he's showing them clearly. They're in this prison, they're, they're bound up in chains, they're oppressed, and all these things that he's saying about how he delivers them. He's breaking the chains off their hands. He's breaking the, the gates open for them to go free. He's taking them out of the dark dungeon and bringing them out into the light. That's what he wants to do, brothers and sisters. He came to give it life to the full, not just 50%. You've got these suspicions that, you know, a Christian life shouldn't have this kind of uh, chronic character to it of defeat and darkness. Let's, I'm not saying, you, but if you're willing, let's go here. Let's look at it. Is there some basic obedient point in Scripture that you're bitter toward or rejecting? This is what He's wanting to show us and teach us this morning. He's given us His Word, but it has to be taken. All right, so I want to give three scenarios that are big for all of us and see, let God step on your toes, okay? You up for it? These are common pressures and pains for us, even as Christians. Let's talk about money first, just since we already went to Malachi 3. That's what the Israelites are struggling with. It's not uncommon. We don't have to act like we're better than them, right? But it is the right question to ask because money pressures are, are big, common. You feel the weight of it, getting squeezed, money pain. Well, let's ask this question. Are you tithing as a starting point of basic obedience? And then are you ultimately pursuing sacrificial generosity? Maybe there's a connection to the pain and pressure financially. Because there's something real plain right there in Scripture. You go ask the third grade, they'd come say, it's pretty simple, tithe. And you go, and we do this, right? So we go, oh, but that's an Old Testament thing. Listen, you, you go read Matthew 23, 23. Jesus connects the dots. He says, no, you, you do the former without giving, do, do the latter without without sacrificing the former. It's, it's New Testament. And if you want to really have an honest, sincere pursuit of understanding Scripture to obey it, the New Testament's going to lead you to just go way beyond 10% in your heart of generosity. It's worth looking at. Money pressures. Maybe there's just a super simple, plain thing that we go, oh, you know what, what I'm really doing is I'm bitter towards God's Word and not obeying it. Even many of us who might consider us, our, ourselves Bible people. That's just one. Oh, but the toe-stepping continues. What about marriage? Marriage pain and pressure. That's another common one. Are we pursuing with all of our hearts, not perfection, but a legitimate and honest good faith effort towards taking the simple, very plain design and counsel of God and living it out? If not, well, no wonder we're in the dungeon all right, let's start with husbands. Husbands, how about this? It's very plain. Are you loving your wife as Jesus loves the church? Is that your pursuit? Is that your earnest, heartfelt, good faith effort and focus? Darkness mystery solved, right? Let's repent and align with that. Here's what the Bible says. Husbands, love your wives. Just like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, Whoa. You go, but you don't understand how difficult my wife is. Oh, and you think the church is less difficult to Jesus? <laughs> that has nothing to do with it. It's between you and God, and are you going to give him the power of simple obedience? Maybe that's what's been missing. Maybe that's what's blind, your blind spot. Like Jesus loves the church and gave himself up for her. You're to serve her. Your leadership in her life is a self-sacrificing leadership. It's a putting her needs ahead of your own. Not whether she deserves it or has earned it or not. No. 
just love as Christ loves the church. And it's a spiritual one to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the Word. That does not mean you preach the Scripture at her. It means you demonstrate a growing walk with Jesus to her. You serve as that spiritual leader and catalyst and, and nurturer of her. Is that what you're doing? Maybe mystery solved on some of or m- much of the marriage woes. And he wants to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands, love your wives. Okay. In 1 Peter 3, Peter says, Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner. And that doesn't mean less capable partner. That means more precious in a fragile and valuable kind of a way. Nurture, protect, guard, elevate her. Notice this too, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. It's right. You know, because of Christ, His finished work, we're not under the law. I get that. That's exactly right. We don't have to obey all that stuff to, get, to go to heaven. There is no condemnation for those who are Christ. But what you're going to experience day in and day out will absolutely be impacted by whether you are going after aligning your day-to-day attitudes and behaviors and practices with the counsel of God with the words of God. So much so, here we go, New Testament. Look, you, you may have some serious blockage between what you're hoping to accomplish when you talk to God in prayer and what you actually receive in response. Your prayers can be hindered if you're not doing the basic obedience. That's what's happening in Psalm 107, 11 for us today. The power of simple obedience. If you took this verse down to the third graders and had them come back and tell us, it's not hard to get this, is it? Okay, good. The power of simple, basic obedience. Oh, what about wives? Yeah. Are you submitting to your husbands and giving them respect as the church does Jesus, or as the church is supposed to Jesus? Oh, this one's unpopular. Modern, hasn't modern psychology figured out this better? Oh, I don't know. Look around and tell me how marriages are going. How's that working out? So, again, I'll try not to step on your toes. Let's, I'll let Jesus do it. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. I mean, I, we work hard to go, well, that means something different than, no, it doesn't. Or that applied differently. Or wasn't that a different time? Or wasn't that a different mindset? The power of simple obedience. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. And now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. Yeah, it's kind of rough stuff, isn't it? No, it's glorious stuff. It's because God's heart for you is what's best because he came to give you life and life to the full. We find ourselves in these dark dungeons of chains and misery crying out out of our misery because we have failed to just simply obey. And and by so doing, we're, we're kind of bitter toward the words of God. We're rebelling against the counsel of the Most High as if the least low, like us, know better. The power of simple obedience. What about parenting now that we're going? Let's go all three for three on stepping on toes. And again, it's not a formula. If you do this, Parent, your kids will work out a certain way. No, 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 don't hear something wrong. But there's parenting counsel of God in Scripture. We want to seek that. And are we faithfully implementing the wisdom and practices given in the Scripture? How about discipline? It's primarily for parents of younger kids, right? <clears throat> Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far away. Oh, but that's Old Testament, right? Sounds like a pretty easy to understand statement, doesn't it? In Proverbs 23, don't withhold discipline from a child. If you punish them with the rod, they're not going to die. Punish them with the rod and save them from death. Again, I'll let you work this out with God, but are we trying to justify it away or explain it away or the power of simple obedience? parenting I ask you another question are you consistently intentionally teaching your children God's word and God's ways scripture says this the commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts and impress them on your children talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road when you lie down when you get up that's not 
complex or too difficult to understand, is it? The question is, will we do it? Parents, are you providing consistent nurturing and modeling? Scriptures, Ephesians, fathers, don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Okay, let me see if we've got a question or two. But whether it's a big things like money or marriage or parenting, the Bible's got things for us that, are, that the third grade could come teach us. about just about every area of life that matters to us, every scenario that could end up with us crying out in misery going, ah, I'm overwhelmed, it's dark in here, I'm at the end of my rope, could be, again, not a blanket, you, you, you deal with God on this, there's so much we don't have time to address today, but it could be, take a look, like those people in verse 11, could it be that maybe in one little way, some of the words of the Lord or being despised or treated bitterly? Okay, here's a question. Does anyone grow spiritually in times of plenty and victory, or is it only in times of struggle that we grow? That's a really good question. I've heard a, a statement that's true, or I think true generally. It says, human beings can handle anything except prosperity. <laughs> like, we, we, can, we can endure some of the most horrific challenges and misery and pain, but we're not really good at handling success. So there, to a certain extent, and you see this Psalm 107 is beautiful that way, isn't it? I mean, the heart of God is so eager and ready and excited to answer our prayers. And it seems like our best prayers come out of anguish, don't they? So yeah, those things tend to be connected. We grow most in those times of distress, unfortunately. But I don't think it's impossible in fact, I think that's what will reflect a maturing faith. As you grow and you walk with Jesus more and more, part of the evidence of how he's starting to, you're starting to become more like him, it's the mind of Christ is just becoming how you think more and more, the Holy Spirit's reigning increasingly in your life. I think that that is a setup to even being able to keep growing sweeter and stronger even as things are favorable and bountiful. I, I think so. so not, not exclusively, but it, it tends to go that way quite a bit. <laughs> you mean I've got to stop reading the RSV? No, no, I have to stop reading the RSV. Okay, no. All right, there we go. Thanks, Skip. All right. Could we, uh, could we possibly start printing sermon notes? I can't keep up. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, this is, these are great ideas. All right, thank you. Um, <laughs> These are not necessarily theological questions, but, well, come on, maybe we do a class on writing notes faster, right? We can go back. We can go back on any of these. All right. Uh, this is a great one. Uh, it says, I struggle with the fourth commandment and Saturday, Sunday worship. The fourth commandment is remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Am I giving in to societal norms or pressure? I, I, I want to relate to that. I relate to that one very uh, directly. I, I feel the same. To me, if I at least ones I'm aware of, and I, I'm open to the fact that I could be blind to several arenas. But as I study the very simple teaching of Scripture, the fourth commandment kind of haunts me in terms of my own practice, my own lifestyle. Because of this, now, we know, I know, we're not under the law. We don't have to keep the Old Testament commandments. I understand that. Especially in terms of the, the sacrificial system, because Jesus is the ultimate final sacrifice. No more sacrifice is relevant. It's done. And the ceremonial law, like we're, we don't go through the same ceremonies religiously, all that just done. But there are certain parts of the law that are moral law, um, like the fourth commandment. Uh, you know, keep the Sabbath. Do we have to keep the Sabbath? No, we don't have to. Don't have to. Don't have to to be right with God. But it also doesn't negate the value of being impacted by what that would look like if I incorporated the spirit of the Sabbath law into my life. And honestly, I mostly don't. Uh, because, think about this, Jesus honored the Sabbath as was commanded in the Old Testament, as God commanded. Uh, and if Jesus did, and sh that's not necessarily connected to Judaism as directly. It's connected to humanity. Why? Because it goes back to creation. It goes back to what God modeled. He created in six days, rested on the seventh. 
So when he gives that as a part of the Ten Commandments, it's a revelation of his heart. It's a revelation of what's best for us, right? And I know most of my life, under, yeah, I've just blown right through that one as if it's not even in here, like it doesn't even matter. I'm trying to figure out, and I need to, maybe it's just full repentance and total change, but I, I'm struggling with that one, working on that one. That's been a, a, a struggle for me. I, I guess back to the question, uh, okay, so you, you just kind of treat Saturday like every other day. Saturday is typically the Sabbath, but some people might do it Sunday. You treat it like every other day, and you're just, just as busy, just as hairy, just as running around scattered as every other day. Good question would be, well, how's that working out for you? Is that getting you more to that life to the full that Jesus has come to give, his ways? Or is it like, no, that's more ending up producing life to the half or life to the three quarters? So somewhere in there, there's not a legalistic response like I have to do this. But somewhere in there, there's a grace-filled, you know, alignment with the best heart of God for me, which somehow in there, the spirit of Sabbath spoken in the commandment of Sabbath there's something I know that it says very plainly. Again, third graders could come and explain it better. But, um, yeah, that, that's one I'm working on and wrestling with. I appreciated that question very much. So, okay. Let me pray for us. And we're going to finish. Listen, we're going to finish with a great song that I'm very excited about because as we saw in each of the contexts of the four, peop- four scenarios, people crying out to God, God delivered, and then they responded saying so. They responded praising God. That's how we're going to finish. And let's do that from our hearts. Let me pray over us and for us this morning. God, I do. I ask that you would help us with this. Reveal these blind spots, Lord. And maybe for many of us, there's a pretty radical, full-blown confession and repentance needed. A a 180 in some way. Lord, for others of us, there's there's some kind of definite movement. We, we need to bring our full hearts, our full spirits, our, our full uh, habits and practices. We need to bring it into alignment with, with what's clearly laid out in your word. And so, God, maybe that's the explanation for many of the things we're struggling with. Maybe not all. That's not a blanket thing. But, God, show us where it is. Show us what to do and give us the faith and the courage and the boldness to obey. And to align with a simple obedience, Lord. And I know, as we talked about back in February, getting ready for this month of March, when we pray for what's needed in our country, we pray for revival and awakening. God, we know it starts by drawing a circle on the floor, getting down on our knees in the middle of that circle and saying, please, God, bring a revival in the circle. And Lord, maybe this is that. The very practical way you're going to bring revival, the very practical way you're going to heal us and deliver us through your word. So, Oh, please, God, break us where we need to be broken. Convict us where we need to be convicted. Fill us with yourself. Change us. Deliver us in your good grace, your eager deliverance and mercy for us. Thank you for it. We receive it right now, and we we want to stand, and we want to sing right now, and, and we want to say so, and we want to praise you. We want to extol your name in the congregation. We want to declare your worth and your goodness all over this world. So let what we sing here now be what we are able to share and speak when we go out from this place. And I thank you, God, that you're doing that. In Jesus' name, amen.
so thankful you guys joined us this morning. Hope and pray you guys have a great week. Thanks for being with us.